I want to start by showing you something that, at first glance, looks a bit unusual. What you are seeing is a microscope I have created to investigate very high-dimensional landscapes that we have never really been able to visualize before. Unlike conventional visualization approaches, this method allows us to watch the entire landscape of extremely high-dimensional spaces in a single shot. We are no longer slicing, projecting, or guessing what the rest of the structure might look like. Instead, we are looking at the whole thing at once. This method is not just a conceptual idea. It is implemented in a Python code that you can access using the link in the description below. You can run it yourself, experiment with it, and apply it to your own models or mathematical functions. In both physics and machine learning, there are two particularly important landscapes that we would love to visually inspect. The first one is the loss function, and the second one is the free energy. These two objects sit at the heart of how we understand probabilistic models of machine learning. The problem is that, unless we are working with toy problems, these landscapes live in spaces with far more than three dimensions. Conventionally, we can only visualize up to three dimensions, and even then, one of those dimensions is always reserved for the landscape itself. In other words, using standard plotting techniques, we can only directly visualize functions that depend on no more than two variables. Anything beyond that becomes inaccessible to our intuition. So if you are interested in seeing how this method works, why conventional plotting fails in high dimensions? What exactly we need to change to make visualization possible? And how to interpret this high dimensional microscope? Stay tuned. Did you know that every machine learning model, from simple regression to image generating models like DAL-E, can be explained by a single elegant equation? If you're interested in learning machine learning in a unified way, visit our webpage at compuflare.com. This is a unique place to understand every machine learning model through one elegant equation from a physics-inspired perspective. In addition to the courses, we offer end-to-end -end intermediate and advanced projects that develop your skills, experience, and online presence, helping you land top industry roles. Visit compuflare.com and start building your data science career. Let me now explain why we even need to visualize these landscapes in the first place. Visualization is not just about making pretty plots. It is about building intuition and gaining insight into how complex systems behave. Let us start with the loss function landscape. The majority of machine learning models are trained by minimizing some notion of error in their predictions. Technically, this error is called the loss function. The loss function is a function of the free parameters of the model, meaning all the weights and biases that the model can adjust during training. There are several important reasons why we would like to visualize the landscape of the loss function over its free parameters. One of the most common optimization methods we use is gradient descent. Gradient descent is a bit like trying to find something in your room while your eyes are closed. You move your hands around, feel the objects near you, and based on that local information, you take a small step in what seems like the right direction. Step by step, you hope to get closer to what you are looking for. Now imagine how much easier that task would be if you simply opened your eyes and looked around. Visualization plays a similar role for optimization. Another reason is that loss functions can have many local minima. Gradient descent can easily fall into one of these false minima and get stuck there, even though a much better solution exists elsewhere. If we had a global view of the landscape, we could spot these issues more easily and potentially design strategies to avoid them. A third issue is that sometimes the loss function becomes very flat in certain regions. In those flat areas, the gradient provides little to no guidance about which direction to move in. By visualizing the landscape, we can better understand where these flat regions are and how to escape them. A very similar story appears when we talk about free energy landscapes. Both physics and machine learning rely heavily on probabilistic models, and many of these models share a unified probabilistic form. The probability of a configuration can often be written as an exponential of minus the free energy F, divided by a normalization constant Z. In this expression, the free energy defines the landscape, and the normalization constant can be computed once the free energy is known. This means that if we know the free energy landscape, we essentially know everything about the model. All other information can, in principle, be extracted from it. 
The most likely scenarios, meaning the configurations with the highest probability, correspond to the global minima of the free energy. Once again, we are faced with the problem of searching for a minimum in a very high-dimensional space. The same challenges arise here as with loss functions. We want to avoid false local minima, and we want to avoid getting stuck in flat regions. Once again, having a global view of the landscape would help us answer these questions much more quickly. So why is it so hard to visualize spaces with more than two dimensions? To understand that, we need to carefully examine what we are actually doing when we visualize low-dimensional spaces. Let us start with the simplest case. Assume that our loss function or free energy depends on only one variable, which we can call x. In that case, visualization is straightforward. We simply plot the value of the function on the y-axis and the variable x on the x-axis. But how do we actually create this plot? First, we prepare a list of possible x values that we are interested in. For example, we might take values from minus 3 to plus 3 in small increments. Then, for each x value in that list, we compute the corresponding value of the function and store it in another list of the same size. Finally, for each pair of x and function values, we place a marker on the canvas at the appropriate location. Now let us move up one dimension and consider a function that depends on two variables, x sub 1 and x sub 2. To visualize this, we again create lists of x sub 1 values and x sub 2 values over the ranges we care about. For each pair of values, we compute the function and place a marker in three-dimensional space. The height of the marker represents the value of the function, while its position in the plane represents x sub 1 and x sub 2. This produces the familiar three-dimensional landscape plot. However, this is not the only way to interpret what we are doing. To visualize higher dimensional spaces, we need to reinterpret how this plotting process actually works. The conventional interpretation breaks down when the function depends on more than two variables. If a function depends on three variables, we would need a fourth spatial dimension to represent its value. We simply do not have that. This is where the traditional interpretation fails. So let us go back and rethink the process. Instead of thinking of x sub 1 and x sub 2 as spatial coordinates, we can merge them into a single object. We can create a list where each element is a tuple containing both x sub 1 and x sub 2. Each tuple can be interpreted as a label rather than a numerical coordinate. Now, our plot becomes much simpler. We have a set of labels and a corresponding set of function values. We can arrange this information into a table with two columns. One column contains the labels, and the other contains the function values. The next question is how to display these labels on a canvas. Since labels do not have a numerical nature, we need to map them to numbers. One convenient way to do this is to use angles on a circle. The range from 0 to 360 degrees contains infinitely many real numbers, which means we can accommodate an arbitrarily large number of labels. We can assign each label a unique angle. Then we use a circular coordinate system where the angle represents the label and the radius represents the value of the function. Each data point becomes a marker placed at the appropriate angle and radius. The key advantage of this approach is that it completely removes the limitation on the number of variables. No matter how many variables the function depends on, we can merge them into a single label and visualize the entire landscape at once. Let me now move on to the first concrete use case. This is the simplest possible scenario, where the free energy f is only a function of a single variable x. This case is extremely useful because it allows us to directly compare what we already know from conventional plots with what we see through the microscope. In the standard plot of this function, we clearly observe two maxima, with one of them being taller than the other. When we place the same function under the microscope, we again see two maxima appearing which tells us that the microscope is faithfully capturing the same structural information as the conventional plot. However, an important issue immediately becomes apparent. In the microscope representation, the radius is used to represent the value of the function. As a result, the minima of the function are much harder to spot because they sit very close to the center of the circle, where the radius is close to zero. To handle negative values of the function, we first shift the entire plot upward into the positive region. 
This is done by adding a constant value to all function values globally. This operation does not lose any information and does not change the structure of the landscape. However, even after this shift, the minima remain difficult to visualize because they are still clustered near the center with very small radii. The solution is to flip the landscape by multiplying all function values by minus 1. This transforms maxima into minima and minima into maxima. Now, when we apply the microscope to this transformed function, the features that correspond to the original minima become clearly visible as prominent maxima. As you can see, the microscope once again shows two maxima, but this time they correspond to the minima of the conventional plot. The second use case builds on this idea, but now the free energy F is a function of two variables, x sub 1 and x sub 2. In this case, we generate a random function and visualize it in the conventional way using a three-dimensional plot. Since this is still within the limits of what traditional visualization can handle, we can directly compare the conventional landscape with the microscope output. As before, we place both F and its negative F under the microscope so that we can clearly visualize both maxima and minima. By comparing the conventional three-dimensional plot with the corresponding microscope representations, it becomes very clear how peaks and valleys in the traditional landscape are transformed into angular and radial features in the microscope. This side-by-side -side comparison makes it much easier to build intuition for how to interpret the microscope plots. The third use case is where conventional visualization methods completely fail. Here, we again generate a function f, but this time it depends on three variables. As a concrete example, consider the following function, which combines multiple exponential terms and nonlinear interactions between the variables. At this point, there is no meaningful way to create a conventional plot of this function that captures its full structure. This is precisely where the microscope becomes essential. When we visualize this function using the microscope, the structure of the landscape immediately reveals itself. The plot shows multiple local or false maxima, as well as two equal global maxima. This information would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to extract using standard visualization techniques. This is the first time we are using the microscope to visualize a genuinely high-dimensional landscape that cannot be visualized conventionally. As you can see, the result is highly informative and provides a clear global view of the landscape structure. Finally, let me discuss the fourth use case, which is the loss function of a feed-forward neural network. In this example, we train a simple neural network with one hidden layer consisting of two neurons. To keep the setup as simple as possible, we assume a single input neuron and a single continuous output. We use the mean squared error loss function for this network. When we count all the weights and biases in the model, we find that the loss function depends on seven free parameters. Next, we generate a synthetic dataset and use it to construct the loss function L as a function of these seven parameters. Under normal circumstances, we would minimize this loss function using gradient-based optimization methods to find the optimal parameter values. These optimal values correspond to the global minimum of L. Since we want to locate this global minimum using the microscope, we multiply the loss function by minus 1 so that its minima appear as maxima in the visualization. When we apply the microscope to this seven-dimensional loss function, we obtain a global view of its landscape. The global minimum, now represented as a maximum, is marked with a red marker. What becomes immediately clear is that even this very simple neural network has a highly non-trivial loss landscape. It contains many equally good minima as the global minimum marked by the red marker. The rapid fall and rise of the bar heights in the microscope view might suggest that our neural net's loss function is of the shape of a seven-dimensional Mexican hat. While we need to explore this possibility in more detail in future videos, for now, let's look at a two-dimensional Mexican hat, which we can visualize conventionally and its equivalent microscope view. As you can see, the two-dimensional microscope view shows a similar repeated rise and fall of the bar's heights. I hope you have enjoyed this exploration and that these examples have helped clarify how the microscope works and why it is such a powerful tool for understanding high-dimensional landscapes. We will use this microscope in our future videos to investigate various neural networks. 
If you are interested to hear more, stay tuned.